Well, it's a privilege to be back with you all this morning. Thanks for listening and not throwing tomatoes. Uh, it's a song that I've that I've loved for for many years. Just a reminder of, <clears throat> and Nathan was actually saying yesterday on Saturday, he said, "Can you imagine what Saturday was like for the disciples?" You ever thought of that? What what that Saturday was like? I mean, Friday was rough. But then as, as you process things, we just went through the death of my mother-in-law uh, back in December, and her death was very, very difficult. But the days after are almost more difficult as the reality sets in. Saturday for the disciples must have been terrible. But then came Sunday morning, right? And that's that's where I'd like to spend our time today. Um, I was told, just got to make sure that I've got everything good here, all right? I was told uh, by Rob that uh, I was going to speak on missions today, right? That's That was the topic. And uh, th this was months ago, back when we first lined this up. And then and then he came back and said, do you realize it's actually Easter Sunday that you're coming? And I said, yeah, I, I realized that. He said, well, you think we could like change direction and, and go uh, Easter topic instead? Well, you know, as as speakers, that's that's easy, right? You know, you just prepare a new message no problem <clears throat> well the more i spent thinking about this going okay so i need to change directions and and change this to easter i realized that that missions really is all about easter and that the easter message is about missions and uh so it actually was not that difficult to uh to quote unquote change direction, but I'd like to spend our time this morning in Luke 24. So if you can turn in your Bibles there to Luke chapter 24. There's someone in the waiting room. Should I accept them or is that your job? I don't know if I'm supposed to click on something or why it's popping up on my screen, but <clears throat> I'll just eliminate it. There you go. So Luke chapter 24, and um, I'd like to read the entire chapter with you this morning. We read a piece of it this morning. I'd like to read this entire chapter with us as we consider missions, proof and purpose of the resurrection. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles, and their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened here, there in the, these days? And he said to them, what things? 
So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since all these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is, it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us when he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, but while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, these are the words which I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Father, as we open your word today, we rejoice as these first believers, these first disciples, recognizing the amazing miracle that had happened that day, that Sunday, the first day of the week, where sadness turned to joy, crying turned to laughter, and desperation turned to hope and assurance. Father, as we consider your word today, would you, would you help us? Would you guide our minds? Would you do what you did for those disciples? Remove the blinders, cut through the haze. Help us to comprehend the truths of your word. Father, bless this time, I pray. May any words of my own that are not yours fall from the minds of the listeners. And may your word dwell richly in each one. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. The reason for reading the entire chapter was I couldn't decide where to cut off. 
It's like, well, I'll, I'll take this piece out. No, I can't take that. No, that's, that's key. Well, I'll just start here. No, I can't leave that out. And so that's why I decided we had to read the entire chapter. And, and really, we could just have prayed and walked away. And, and the blessing of the Lord's word dwelling in our hearts richly would have been tremendous. But I'd like to just point a few elements out for you this morning as we consider the proof and purpose of the resurrection. Now, many in times past, I'm sure it's it's been done here of uh, going through and, and looking at evidence of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember in high school, this was one of the topics that really interested me. And so when they said, you have to do a research paper and you're going to have to read tons and document all these things, and you're going to have to dig in and, and prove something, I went, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I read probably five to 10 books, kind of thick books for a 17, 18 year old to, to go through. But I, I just thoroughly enjoyed reading the, the wonderful truths that, that we find even in science and in historical records that point to evidence of the proof of the resurrection. But this morning, I instead of doing that, and also because I couldn't find my research paper, been too many too many years. Uh, I'd like to go into some of the things that we find here in this passage, and how they uh, kind of show this. The missions is the proof and and purpose of the resurrection. Um, I'd like to start with the witness of the disciples, the transformational witness of the disciples. The Lord Jesus Christ there in verse 48 says, you are witnesses of these things. He almost literally said, you all will be missionaries. You will be sent out to proclaim the truth of this, of what has happened. You will be witnesses. And, and this is not the only place where we see this. In Acts 1.8, as, as we see the, the start of the church era in Acts 1.8, Lord Jesus Christ says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I'd like to just see a contrast here between what it says here in Acts and how the Lord Jesus said this in Luke. Here in Acts, he's talking about all these different places, and he says, You shall be a witness in all of these places. But in Luke, it says, you are witnesses. Do you understand the distinction of that? You will be, you shall be, you are witnesses. Now, I'm no grammatical expert, but if you are a witness, it's, it's something that it, it makes you up. That's, that's who you are. It's not something necessarily that you do. You do that because of who you are. A dog barks because, okay, I already lost half the crowd. A dog barks because he's a cat, right? No, come on, guys. A dog barks because he's a dog. That's who he is. That, that, that's, that's who the animal is. That's the kind of animal. Witnesses witness because they're a witness. So Jesus says, he doesn't just go say, go witness. He says, you are witnesses. And then it gets repeated tons of times over the book of Acts. So we'll just look at, at a few of them. Acts 2.32. Uh, Peter here says in his first sermon on, on, uh, at uh, Pentecost, he says, this Jesus, God has raised up. Resurrection. God has raised up. Of which? We are all witnesses. Acts 3, 15, middle of, the, middle of a message here after healing the lame man on Solomon's porch. Again, Peter says, and killed the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Acts 5, 32. After being thrown in jail and miraculously released from jail, they're brought before the council, and this is what Peter says, and we are his witnesses to these things. Acts 10, 39, speaking to Cornelius and those with him, Peter says, and we are witnesses of all the things which he did, both in the land of Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Acts 10.41 in the same 
And the same message there to Cornelius, he goes on to say, not, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him. So they were chosen to be witnesses. And then just one example that's not Peter, Acts 13, 31, where Paul in Antioch and Pisidia says, he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. The resurrection was transformational for the witnesses. It changed the lives of these disciples. Now, one sense, even as the song says, um, these distraught disciples, totally afraid, they're enclosed, they're, they're locking doors, they're, they're trying to make sure nobody can come to them. They're absolutely afraid. To see those same disciples 40 days later, publicly, proudly, boisterously, courageously, boldly proclaiming, he has risen from the dead. He is alive. This is great news. You must hear this. These are not the same people. They've been transformed. They've been changed by a reality, by a truth. That Jesus Christ died for their sins, but had risen according, according to the scriptures. <clears throat> Christ's resurrection was transformational for these witnesses. Now we'll, we'll mention this briefly later, but we also are witnesses. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't tell us here in these passages where he told the disciples, you are witnesses. He was saying, you are eyewitnesses. You are individuals that have seen me physically alive from the dead. You saw me die, and now you see me alive. You are witnesses to my resurrection. Are we witnesses in the same way? No, we have not seen firsthand. We cannot say with, with uh, John, I believe I have it somewhere later in my notes, but First uh, John, we have seen, we've handled no, we can't say the exact same things that they could. But we are witnesses. If we have experienced, if we have known, if we know the risen Savior. Do you know the risen Savior? Do you know this, this one of whom we talk this morning? I won't take much time to go into the beauty of the good news that we are witnesses of. But do you know him? Have you experienced that transformational power in your life? Just as these disciples went from, from, from terribly afraid, distraught individuals to bold proclaimers of a risen Christ, he wants to do the same in your life today. When you recognize and you repent, we're going to talk about that here in a moment. When you repent from your sin and are saved gloriously because of his death and resurrection, then you become a witness as well. It's not just something you do. It's something you are. And if you are a witness, then you also witness. That's what witnesses do. So there was the transformational witness of the disciples. You are witnesses of this thing. But then there's also the tested truthfulness of their story. The tested truthfulness of their story. These men and women, not only could you see a transformation take place in their attitudes and their action and their way of living, they were willing to die for this truth. Now, right before the crucifixion, you remember what happened where Peter said, I will die for you. And everyone said, oh, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll do. And then the guards come and everyone comes to take Jesus. And what happens? They all flee, right? One even leaves his clothes. He's so scared and runs out of there naked. Now, they're willing to die. 
for the Lord Jesus Christ. What changed? The resurrection. The living Christ. There is now a tested truthfulness to the story that they're telling. All but one from history, we, we, would, uh, we would believe that all but one of the 12 apostles were murdered, were killed, were martyred for their testimony. Side note, what does martyr mean? Witness. They witnessed with their death. They proved the truthfulness of this story that a man died and came back to life. Acts chapter 7 tells us the story of one such man, Stephen, a witness in death. He says, but he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the son of man, that's Jesus, thought he was dead. No, I see the son of man standing at the right hand of God. Does that sound like a made up story? Who makes up stories like that? He was willing to die for this reality. Witnesses in death, tested truthfulness. Are you willing to die for what you believe? Am I willing to die for what I believe? Do you realize that brothers and sisters in Christ, just like you and I, are dying just like Stephen died today for their faith? in other parts of the world. There are parts in the world where it's illegal to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. For you to proclaim, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and rose from the dead, that is a death sentence. But they're willing to do it because they're witnesses of the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's so many testimonies told these are, are, are literally living missionaries. These are individuals that are going about sharing what they've seen, what they know, what they believe. 1 Corinthians 15, 6 says, After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. And then he adds this interesting note, of whom the greater part remain to the present. So they're still alive. What does that mean? You can go ask them. It's easy to reference dead people, right? Oh, yeah, you know, my great-grandfather could tell you what a great person I am. Uh, he's not with us anymore, but, um, yeah, if he was here, he could tell you. But if I tell you, uh, well, there's, there's some here in the audience that, that know me. They can tell you about me. They're my son and my daughter and my wife. If you want to know about something about me, go talk to them. They've experienced me. They're witnesses to who I am. Here were 500 that were witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ living after his death. There were testimonies to be told. You know, even today, believers, as I mentioned, in many parts of the country, many parts of the world are suffering. Others are willing to go to foreign or familiar soil to be witnesses to this reality. Testimonies told. Are, are you willing to tell your testimony? Maybe you don't have a testimony to tell, and that's why you don't want to tell it. Are you willing to share? Are you willing to be one of these 500 that say, yeah, I was there. I know him. I can speak personally of this Jesus Christ who died and rose again. And then there's the proof of the turning upside down of the known world by that first century church. What a, what a great missional story this is of witnesses going around oftentimes because of persecution, that persecution would come and the believers had to scatter. And as they scattered, as they went everywhere doing whatever they needed to do, some of them engaged in business, some of them traveling, but they were all being witnesses. And they turned the known world upside down. They were accused there in Thessalonica 
of having turned the world upside down. This kind of missional impact is not caused by a lie. The lies eventually die out, don't they? We see that today all the time. You know, lies come out on the news, lies come out, you know, in all sorts of places are sources of lies. But lies eventually die because they're proven to be what they are. But truth cannot be stamped out. And the truth of the risen Savior was transformational, and it turned the known world upside down. The resurrection is the only explanation for this kind of growth in the early church. If it was a lie, it would never have turned the, the world upside down. If it was just these, these pitiful little distraught disciples that said, you know what, guys, you know what, this kind of looks like this doesn't look very good for us. Um, maybe we should like make up a story and say that, you know, he, he came back to life and, and, and then go out and share that story. And, and, and maybe somebody will believe it. How believable do you think that would have been? How long do you think that story would have lasted? It would not have if it hadn't been true. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 says, And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. If Christ is not risen, it's all for naught. But I love how Paul goes on to say here in 1 Corinthians in verse 20, But now, Christ is risen. From the dead. But now Christ is risen from the dead. So, what does that mean? Our preaching is not empty. Our preaching is full. Our preaching is full of life, and our faith is full. We have something to witness, we have a truth to live out in our lives and to share with all around us. Philippians, Paul explains the source of the power in his ministry in Philippians, where he, he expresses his ultimate focus and his ultimate desire in, in Philippians 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. You know, a lot, a lot of us probably grab this piece of this verse and say, yeah, I want to be like Paul. I want to know him, and I want to know the power of his resurrection. But sometimes we take it out of context, don't we? Have you read Philippians 3? Are you sure you want that? Well, if you want that, take what comes with it. This verse explains the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul has just said in a few verses before, I count all things but lost. From the loss, everything that he was, he, he had so much going for him as a human, as a Jew. He says, I count it all but loss. And I want one thing. I just want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to live for him. He is my only focus and desire. Does that describe your life today? Can you say... Everything else I have, my career, my money, my wealth, my cars, my house, my family, I'm willing to lose it all if that's what he would have. But I want to know him. That's what turned the world upside down. You ever ask yourself, why the church of today doesn't turn the world upside down again. I can't tell you how many times I prayed that prayer. I asked, I asked the Lord, Lord, would you do it again? I want to see the church of today used so mightily that people would accuse us of turning the world upside down. Does anyone accuse Bethany Chapel of turning this neighborhood upside down? I haven't heard those rumors down in Belmar where we go. A lot of people don't even realize we're there. We empowered with the power of his resurrection. Are we willing to count all things but loss? 
of the desire of knowing him. That's a message for another day. We could spend another hour or two on that. And I only have till 4.30, so we must keep moving. So historical and current missions are proof of the resurrection. There's, there's evidence to be seen. This could not have happened if the resurrection was not true. But not only is it proof of the resurrection, but missions is also the purpose of the re resurrection. Let's look back there at Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 49. Then he said to them, These are the words which I have spoken to you while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they may comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ. And then we've got three infinitives here in the original. To suffer, it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. Or we could say to suffer, to rise, to preach in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. So we find that missions also is the purpose for the resurrection. Jesus in this passage does three things. And I just want to look at this briefly. Three things where he explains his purpose behind his suffering, his death and resurrection. First of all, he points to the prophecy or he points to scripture. He exemplifies witnessing. He, he kind of puts on the stage for us what witnessing should look like. That's probably the water from three weeks ago, right? Um, <clears throat> it's good water though came out of the tank <laughs> um, so Jesus exemplifies for them what a witness looks like how do you witness how, how do you how do you share with others allow for others to see what you've seen to experience what you've experienced what what is the what is the rock solid evidence what is the place to point to we don't have Jesus here in flesh to point to, but we still point to the word, the logos, the word of God. So Jesus does just that. He says, all things must have been fulfilled, which were written, and he opens our understanding so that they can understand the scriptures. And he says, thus it is written. I think we need to say that a little bit more often. Thus it is written. This is what the Bible says. How many times today do we get in arguments and debates about truth or untruth? And it really comes down to one thing. This is what is written. The written does not change. The word of God remains forever. It is eternal. It does not change. So what was true 2,000 years ago is still true today. Brothers and sisters, we need to do the same thing that the Lord Jesus Christ did and say, thus it is written. That's what a witness does. Scriptural based proclamation of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had, he had just done this on the road to Emmaus with those two disciples, didn't he? Where I would have, I would love, this is one of those things that I would, I wish there was a recording of how he walked them through all the scriptures concerning himself. Wouldn't you love to read that? You can. It's here. I would love to see the, see the summary, though. He, he kind of puts on display for them what I see the scripture doing for us of this mosaic. And I probably shared this concept with you before. This mosaic that little pieces are coming together to portray an image of something extremely important. One that was coming that was going to to fulfill it all, to complete the entire picture. And so the suffering of Christ there on the cross and all of his words and all the things that happen, they, they come together and, okay, okay, the image starts, starts to come clear, but there's something missing. And everyone walks away from the cross and goes, but it's not finished. It's not complete. He can't die now. And then the last piece comes into place three days later. 
As the Lord Jesus rises from the dead, the picture is now complete. And we say, hallelujah, what a savior. That's what the Lord Jesus expounds to them. In verse 27, expounds to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Do we know the scriptures well enough to expound them of all things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ? I love the scene there in verse 31, how their eyes were opened and they knew him. This is still his work. Brother and sister, that, that is never our work. We never open eyes. We never open and sometimes it's difficult, right? We try it with our kids. We're like, come on, guys, you've got to get this. This is important. This, is, this will change your life. But we can't open their, the eyes of their understanding. All we can do is expound to them from the scriptures. We can witness. We can share what we've experienced. But we can't force their eyes to be open. That's his work. The Spirit of God now works in the lives of individuals, opening their eyes. And as I shared this morning, I, I love this statement. He was known to them in the breaking of the bread. It's kind of like one of those assembly verses, right? We're known because we do the breaking of bread every, every Sunday. And what a precious time that is every Sunday. I can tell you how many times I've done that and, and how many places I've done that. But it's precious every time because in the breaking of the bread, we recognize him. We remember him. So the Lord Jesus points to the word of God, points to prophecy. But then he also parts the haze in their understanding. And there's, there's two elements here. There's the need. I was just speaking a little bit about the, the eyes needing to be open. Uh, Luke 24, their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. 1 Corinthians 1 says, uh, the, the message of the cross is foolishness. People hear these messages and, and see what we do, and they say, hey, that's just foolishness. If you're sitting here today and you go, this is craziness, it's because your eyes have not been opened. But people will sometimes listen to us and say, this is, this is nuts. This is crazy. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him, nor can he know him. We can't try hard enough. They are spiritually discerned. This is the work of the Spirit. So that's the need. But then the work, he opened their understanding that they may comprehend the scripture. Second Corinthians 4, 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Have you experienced that light? Have you experienced that shining into your heart? Then you know what we're talking about this morning, don't you? You're a witness. One of these days I'm going to fall right down. Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Enlightened by ourselves? No. Enlightened by somebody else? Enlightened by some persuasive speaker? No. Paul says, I didn't come with, to you with persuasive words. That you may know what is the hope of this calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance of the saints? You will know that as he enlightens the eyes of your understanding. God, that's his work. He parts the haze and their understanding. And finally, he proclaims the purpose for the resurrection. Verse 46. Then he said to them, I know this is the third time I've read it. I want you to get it. Thus it is written. And thus it was necessary. There was no other way. It had to happen this way. The Lord Jesus pleaded, if there's any other way, there was not. It was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. 
That story that Jesus would have woven on the road to Emmaus made absolutely no sense without the perfect lamb who died, paid the only price that would have covered what needed to be paid, died, but then rose again. Without the resurrection, we are left without hope of a transformative power and without justification. But when God raised Jesus from the dead, put his stamp of approval on the, on the price that was paid, when Jesus said, it is finished, it's done, God raised him from the dead on the third day. And we now have available to us new life. His righteousness. When God looks at us, those of us that have believed, he now sees his son, his perfect son. As we saw earlier, if Christ had not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Romans 4 says, speaking of Abraham, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it wasn't, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised up for our justification. That's what we enjoy in Christ. So it was necessary. And verse 47 there in, in Luke 24 states that the purpose of the suffering and resurrection was that repentance and remission of sin be preached in his name to all nations. There's your missions connection. Jesus went to the cross and the father raised him up that the good news might be preached to all nations. If there's no good news to preach, can't preach it, can you? But we have good news. We are witnesses, those of us that have believed. Therefore, we must be witnessing. I just one minor thing here. I want you to, to notice there in Luke 24. I, I love that the writer includes this, that the Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed this preaching of repentance. It's not spoken of much today, is it? You know, as you as you hear musicians, artists around the country, Christian artists, Christian preachers preaching what they say is the gospel. How often do you hear that word repentance? Well, repentance usually is tied with repentance. What does it say there in Luke 24? Repentance and remission of what? Ooh, that's a three, four little word that you don't hear much about anymore, do we? But that is what is to be proclaimed. Repentance and remission of sins be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. That's why he suffered, died, and rose. You know, repentance is born out of a heart that recognizes that we are not accepted in God's presence. Repentance is saying, yeah, my way is not right. What God says is right. Having a change of mind and saying, this is the right way I go when I do things my way. And this is the way that God wants me to go. And I'm going to change from going this way and go that way. That's repentance. A total change of mind and heart. Recognizing that who I am is not who I can be in Christ Jesus. Well, that's not very popular today, is it? As we witness, as we are witnesses, we should witness as the Lord Jesus Christ said we should witness. We should say, thus says the scripture. And we should be preaching repentance and forgiveness of sin. There's good news to be had. Forgiveness of sin is just amazing. It's, he's done it all for us. I love if you get a chance, God. There's a there's a message out there by Alistair Begg on the on the the uh, man in the middle cross. 
And he, he says, he says, if you explain your salvation in the third person or in the first person, then you've got it all wrong. How do you know that you are saved? Well, I, well, I, if, if it's I, anything, it's wrong. It's all about him. He forgives sin. We must recognize that we are wrong. We are sinners deserving of hell. And yet he gave his life that I might be saved. It's all about the man on the middle cross who rose from the dead. And then he says there in verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. We've said much about that. I mentioned first John earlier. We won't take the time to look into it. These are the things we've looked at this morning. A transformational witness of the disciples. Tested truthfulness of their story. They were willing to give their lives. Testimonies told of, of ordinary individuals who experienced, who were witnesses. And then the turning upside down of the known world by individuals like a Paul, who was willing to count all things loss to know him. And then the purpose of the resurrection, pointing to prophecy. Thus says the scriptures. May God part the haze in our understanding. Recognize that's his role. And yet we have the wonderful opportunity and responsibility to proclaim. To proclaim repentance and remission of sins to all the nations. Starting in Jerusalem. Where is your Jerusalem? You know, sometimes at CMML, we get individuals that, that come and they say, you know, I, I, I believe the Lord would use me as a missionary. I want to go to Timbuktu, Africa. That's wonderful. So what are you doing today here at home? Um, well, nothing really, but, but I think the Lord wants to use me over in Timbuktu, Africa. Well, if he's not using you as a witness today, he's, nothing's going to change when you get on a magical airplane and go to Timbuktu, Africa. We are witnesses. A witness is a witness no matter where he is. Where are you? I hope I don't have to state the obvious. Are you being faithful? Am I being faithful? Father, we're just so thankful today that we can rejoice and celebrate that the Lord Jesus Christ came and paid the ultimate price, sacrificed himself for us. What a tremendous salvation we have in him. We're so thankful that he did not remain in the grave, but that you raised him from the dead, according to the scriptures. You had foretold it all, and he fulfilled every little dot and tittle of every prophecy. And we are now witnesses. Father, we weren't, we weren't there to see it physically happen, but yet we now see in your word and have experienced in our lives the realities of these truths. Father, you've left us here with a tremendous purpose. And it was the same purpose of the resurrection, of the death and the resurrection, the purpose that these truths be proclaimed that repentance and remission or forgiveness of sins be proclaimed to all the nations, starting in Jerusalem. Father, for the believers here, Yonkers is their Jerusalem. Will you help them to be faithful in their witness? Father, we would ask you to do again today what you did so many years ago. Impact the world with the transformational truth of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.